Okay, so welcome everybody. I hope you can all hear me. We've still got a few people coming in, but my co-host, uh, Jack Airby, suggested we start these webinars with some music, so rather than watching me fumble around, waiting for everyone to, to log in. So that was for you, Jack. Yep. Hope you, did you recognise the tune? I certainly did. What was it? Got no idea. My brain's in <laughs> 76 year old mode, so you, you can't you ask either, me those. You could either answer The Marriage of Figaro by a Mozart opera, or alternatively, you could have answered the, the um, as less cultured, the theme music to the classic 80s movie Trading Places. No, so definitely, fig, definitely Figaro. I was about to hear the tenor come in and start screaming, Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. You don't want to hear me say it, do you? <laughs> Very good. All right, well, welcome everyone. On behalf of the Bowen Health Foundation, my name's Francis Trainer, and we thank you for all joining us this afternoon. Please let me start with the acknowledgement of country. We, the Bowen Health Foundation, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. And we thank the traditional owners for the custodianship of the land and celebrate the continuing culture of the Wadawurrung people, acknowledging the memory of honourable ancestors. We also welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us for this webinar this afternoon. Now today is being run as a webinar, so you can only see myself, Chair of the Barwon Health Foundation Bequest Committee, Jack Airby, who I'll introduce shortly, and some wonderful presenters who we'll also get to in a moment. So as a webinar, we can't see you, but you'll be able to participate, we encourage that, by clicking on the raise hand button towards the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll try and unmute you and get your question for our guest speakers following their presentations. Alternatively, you can type in a question by clicking on the, uh, the chat box. Now, many of you who uh, may have joined us over the last few weeks would know that August has been Legacy Month at Bowen Health Foundation, which is a time to celebrate life, pay tribute to our amazing healthcare heroes, reflect on our own lives, consider our legacy, and hear from some extraordinary minds. In support of Legacy Month, several prominent Geelong law firms, including the Canny Group, who are located down at Federal Mills, have offered their services free for anyone who wants their will written or altered and wish to include a gift to the Bowen Health Foundation. And joining our panel today, we have Catherine Taylor and Samantha Butcher from the Canny Group, who we'll be hearing from shortly. And we also thank Edwina the Wilkins and all the team at the Canny Group for their wonderful support. It's certainly appreciated. And I invite you to call me or email me if you're interested in learning more of this free will offer. Now, over the past few weeks, we've talked to some of the wonderful bequests that the Foundation have received over the years that have made an extraordinary impact to the care provided by Barwon Health for our community. We've talked of the Beth Allerton bequest to the Andrew Love Cancer Centre and the Oncology Pharmacy is now named in honour of the Allerton family. We've also talked of another recent bequest from a local pensioner, Archie Howard, who made a living as a concreter. Archie was a humble man who passed away late last year and decided that in leaving gifts to those who were close to him, that the hospital and the community were equally deserving of his bequest. And Archie's legacy will care for patients and will save lives. We receive bequests both large and small and every single one is an impact, impactful gift to the community for future generations. Legacy is also about in memoriam gifts as a tribute to a loved one who has passed away. And just like a bequest in memoriam gifts, no matter how large or small can make an enormous impact. And legacy is also about the now, the living legacy, where we have community members establishing their own name fund within the Barwon Health Foundation with income directed to their nominated area of health within our service. And those who have donated to our legacy fund and the donors who have had their names or that of loved ones displayed on a special prominent legacy tree feature within the hospital. When we think of Geelong and tell people how great it is, which I often do, the go-to is typically the beautiful waterfront the cool cafes and bars, the wineries, to some the football club, the proximity to an extraordinary world-renowned coast and the thriving health and education hub. But I think the greatest feature of Geelong is without doubt its people, proud, passionate and parochial people. When I think of extraordinary people, I think of the amazing team I work with at the foundation led by Zoe Waters. I think about the wonderful foundation board that boasts a prominent lawyer, Dan Simmons as its chair and the incredibly experienced, committed and supportive people who join him. I also think of the amazing team at Barwon Health from the CEO and executive office to the clinicians and brave healthcare workers to the countless support staff in cleaning and catering and so many other areas that all combine to keep us safe and provide the very best care. 
And I also think of the community, everyone present in this webinar who listens to us to this afternoon and donates towards our pursuits to provide in Geelong the best possible health service. And today we're going to talk to, talk about and hear from some extraordinary people. People like Grovedale retirees, Joan and Brian Gooch, who join us today, who are selflessly supporting our community by taking part in clinical trials. People like Professor Peter Villeman, a special guest this afternoon, who's dedicated to the advancement of what some say is one of Geelong's hidden treasures, extraordinary medical research, which brings the brightest minds to our region. And in an area which Professor Villeman will no doubt explore today, people like the Costa family. I've said before that it would be hard to visualize a parallel Geelong universe without the Costa family. Their contribution to support, to support sport, the arts, health, and so many other pursuits is nothing short of outstanding and something we all benefit from. Recently, Robert Costa, a wonderful man who's also a member of the foundation board, together with his brother, Frank, the Anthony Costa Foundation, and their broader families made an inspiring gift in memory of the late Adrian Costa, who died tragically together with his wife, Mary, almost 48 years ago. The donation will see the establishment of regional Victoria's first medical research clinical trial centre at Barwon Health and will be known as the Adrian Costa Clinical Trials Centre. The research will bridge the gap between what could be provided in regional Victoria with world leading, life saving and life extending clinical trials. Quite an extraordinary gift to Geelong that is also worldwide benefits. We can't thank the Costa family enough. And when thinking of wonderful people, we also have an absolute treasure and a man who is a proud member of the Geelong community and possesses that wonderfully strong social conscience and belief to give back to the region that he loves. I speak of Jack Airby and also his colleagues who form the Foundation's Bequest Committee, the wonderful Bob Eady and Mike Fairweather, three better men you can hardly meet. Jack is well known, respected and loved community member who is involved in diverse areas beyond his occupation as a vet. Now we're going to hear to get to Jack in a second, but before we do, I want to introduce to you Brian and Joan Gooch, who as many of you may have read, are Grovedale retirees who have bravely placed themselves on the front line in the fight against COVID-19 and are soon to participate in a global clinical trial study to, fight, to find a vaccine. Welcome, Joan and Brian. Thank you. Thank you. How are you both today? Good, very, thank you. Very well, thanks. That's good. Now, what you're doing is quite extraordinary, but Brian, it's not the first clinical trial you've been um, involved in. No, I've been involved in a, a number of trials going back probably 10 to 12 years now, starting off with the um, bone density, then we did the shingles, and we're just in the middle of doing, what was that one we're doing now? The virus. The, the, well, the virus, which we're about to do tomorrow, oh, no, the flu, I mean. and the flu injection as well. And Joan, have you been involved in all of those or just some of them? Uh, the only one I've missed out on was the first one, the bone density. Bone density. And, and what's the, the experience like, the procedure like, and the follow-up like? H what's the experience for you? Well, the, the follow-up has been brilliant. And the, the care and um, dedication of the staff there in Geelong with um, Kate and her team in there, it's, it's been no problems at all. You feel, you feel confident. And the follow-up, the phone calls and everything else has been spectacular. And so the first one being 10 years ago, have the results been shared with you? Is that... Um... Yes, they have. Hmm. And so what was the outcome of that one? Now you've caught me off the hop. It was 10 years ago, man. Come on. <laughs> oh, I'm, an old, I'm an old man. <laughs> well, tell me, have you developed shingles? Have you had an issue with bone density? No, not no. at all. No. So, and now I understand that uh, in clinical trials, and Pete would probably know this better than, than, than me, but the, I, I think one in five get a placebo. So in these trials that you do, have you found out later on that you did get the placebo, not the, not the real deal? Yes, Brian has. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it hasn't been a problem. I, I got a little bit crook after, um, after the shingles one, and uh, obviously I was... Uh, I, I had the placebo, the, the placebo but um, oh, right. yeah, I don't know why I got crook, but I certainly did. Now, and, and why do you do it? Why are you putting up your hand to, to be so brave, particularly with this latest one, the COVID-19 vaccine? Um, why, why are you doing it? Well, basically, we like to participate in doing things for the community. And hopefully with the one that we're just about to do, 
will certainly help people worldwide if it, if it is a success, which we're hoping it will be. But just to participate and, and be a, well, I suppose, a participating member of the community. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I'd love to talk to you a lot longer, but we've got so many speakers today. But I want to thank you so much for joining us. And anyone who's interested in volunteering for clinical trials, and these trials, as you said, uh, Brian, with groundbreaking significance, uh, um, particularly the slaves one, let me know and I'll put you in touch with Bree Sarah, who's the, uh, the trials manager. So thank you to Brian and Joan, but stay here because we've got Pete Villain, I'm sure you want to listen to him, and also the guys from the Canny Group are going to speak in a, in a few moments, so stay there. But you're both truly inspirational, wonderful people, and the sort of people that make Geelong such a special place. Thank you. Thank you. Now, back to Jack. So for many years, the Foundation was privileged to have Jack's contribution as a member of the Foundation Council. And today, he lends his hand as Chair and Ambassador of the Bequest and Timberloy Society. He's also a man who has great appreciation of the wonderful health service at Bowen Health. Please give a virtual big hand for Jack Airby. Thank you, Francis. That's very kind of you. Um, all this is about ensuring the future for our families and uh, our uh, relatives, because at the moment I can confidently say that if you're going to get sick, Geelong is a good place to get sick because we have the best services. And what's even better is we are going to be entering into the true research area uh, for, for medicine. You know that, uh, and the other thing to remember is that it wouldn't have started except for bequests because many, many years ago, before there was a Geelong hospital, a chap who was a shepherd died because he's been, he has been got bitten by a black snake, died, but before he died, he got his will and wrote it out and left everything in his estate to build and start the Geelong hospital. And then with the help of the then Geelong advertiser and quite a few other notable people, the Geelong hospital was built and that's evolved into what Bowen Health is today. And Bowen Health is headed for a great future but sadly, governments can't keep supporting what we want to do. So to ensure that this high standard continues on, for, as I say, for our relatives and our and grandchildren in the future, we need to raise funds. And one of the best ways of raising funds is for you to leave something to Bowen Health in your will. It doesn't matter how large or how small it is, every little bit helps and will ensure security in the health area for our future. So if you can leave something, it's fantastic. And in order to help you, we have people who are going to volunteer to draw up your will for nothing. Uh, Samantha Butcher and Catherine Taylor, who are experts in financial planning, wills and estates from the Canny Group. So guys, thank you. Now, Sam is a financial advisor who's been in the finance industry for 18 years and advising for the last 13. She's got a Bachelor of Commerce, majoring in financial planning, as well as a Diploma of Financial Services. But that's not all she has under her belt. She is also a qualified primary teacher in Australia, as well as overseas for six years before changing careers. That is remarkable. She's also not only an invaluable member of the Canny Group, but also in our community, which definitely shows with various boards and committees that you're part of. For the past three years, Sam has been on the Sacred Heart College Scholarship Committee, 10 years as the Clairvaux Family Support Network Coordinator, as well as the last three years as Deakin University Tutorial Workshop Presenter. Sam enjoys meeting clients, listening to their stories and helping them achieve their goals. Can you help me at 74? Thank you. Catherine Taylor holds a Bachelor of, Bachelor of Laws as well as a Bachelor of Criminology and majoring in History. Catherine's passion lies within property, which is why it's no secret that she goes over and above the Canny Group clients with anything related to property needs. She also thoroughly enjoys all aspects of business law, delving deeply into the wills and estates area, also taking charge of clients' needs and ensuring that they are taken care of from the start to the finish. Catherine's well known for being a personal approach to work and is looking forward to establishing herself in the legal profession while creating a reputation that reflects the successes she's already achieved for her clients. So a big welcome to Sam and Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much for having Thanks, us. Jack. We're really great to be here. Thank you for those kind words.
So we're here to talk about today wheels and what we can provide as part of this legacy month. And when we talk about wheels, we don't actually just talk about um, preparing, preparing a, a statement of wishes or your intentions of how you wish for your estate to be dealt with after you pass away. We actually talk about estate planning as part of our process. So part of estate planning is uh, making sure that your affairs in order for the management and disposal of your um, estate now and into the future. Um, it's looking at minimising your costs and duties and taxes um, now and um, also while maximising um, your estate and what we can get out of it. Um, it involves a, a review of your current wills and powers of attorney as well as your superannuation, asset holdings, um, taxes, family, business, any um, any assets you actually deal with as part of your day-to-day -day, um, operations and estate. Um, now in terms of when it's it's a good idea to look at estate planning. Um, most people believe that estate planning is only for those that have a large estate or multiple businesses or multiple structures and that's not the case necessarily. Um, we advise that everybody has a look at um, their estate and it involves talking to um, lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, brokers um, and it's particularly important to have it in place if you don't actually have a will um, or if you've your circumstances have changed in that um, maybe you've gotten divorced or you're in a new relationship or even as simple as your children um, turning 18 and that has a lot of tax um, implications as well. So um, a, a large important point to make is that if you don't actually have a will in place, what happens to your estate? And like I said, a will is your, a statement of your intentions. So um, if you don't have a will in place, um, number one, it can be quite difficult for your family to administer your estate. Um, they're grieving, they're going through a really hard time. And part of that, it becomes quite difficult to actually prove um, your estate and to dispose of your assets from there and to be able to get the benefit from those to your family. Family. Um, there's no statement of intention, so there could be the potential, excuse me, that your estate actually goes to someone who maybe you didn't intend for them to benefit from your estate. Um, Additionally, if your circumstances actually do change, your will um, could become invalid or anything you have set up in place might not benefit um, you at, the, at, the, at that time. So it's really important that as part of the estate planning process, we're actually reviewing everything. Um, we generally say every five years or if something does happen um, before then and your circumstances do change. Um, now, when we say estate planning, we talk about assets that are in your name. Um, some assets don't fall within your estate and can be dealt with a little bit differently. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to pass uh, this over to Sam Butcher, our financial advisor, who's going to talk about um, superannuation. Thanks, Catherine. And also thanks, Jack, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed by, that, by all of that, actually, <laughs> um, but it's nice to hear. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add a few more things. So um, basically, the, uh, as a financial advisor, it's actually really important important that we work together with your solicitor or your lawyer who, who is putting your will together because you may or may not realise that, um, for example, one of the largest assets that we all hold outside of our home is superannuation and superannuation actually falls outside of the estate. So if you think, oh no, I've got everything rosy, I've, um, I've been to the solicitor, I've got my will, I'm all sorted, thanks Sam, see you later. Um, if you think that your superannuation just naturally falls under that, uh, unfortunately you are mistaken. It's really important that we deal with your superannuation separately. We can um, get your superannuation and your will to speak to each other. There is actually a way around it, but you have to set things up correctly to do so. Um, I'm not here to talk about to be all doom and gloom, but I do want to reiterate something that Catherine pointed out before. Um, there is a real risk of dying or passing away into state. So in other words, without a will. Um, and unfortunately, in the last couple of years, I've had a few instances where I have been dealing with families whose, uh, in one most recent example, her, um, an adult child passed away, obviously unexpectedly in, a, in an accident. Um, and she had three young children separated from the father of those children years before. Um, and thought everything was okay because the, the woman had set 
up an insurance policy and said, no, no I'm fine. And my kids are covered because, you know, if, I, if something did happen to me, I've got insurance there. Unfortunately, because those children are actually still under 18 um, and the, because the woman died without a will, uh, the law actually then um, passes, I guess, um, ownership or, or, or legal rights from those children to their next of kin, who happens to be their surviving father. Um, so obviously not a great outcome for that, for that woman's family because um, any estate that she did leave, any money that she did leave has now gone to the control of her ex-partner. So that's, that's just an example of what can happen if you don't take the time uh, to set up a will. And as I said at the start, we will actually, as an advisor, we do, we do work together with a solicitor to actually make sure that we're talking to each other so your estate uh, is left in the best possible outcome. Um, happy to take questions obviously but that's probably the what I wanted to cover off mostly so get a will power of attorney um, I know we haven't really touched on that um, once again very important um, and sorry what I keep saying one more thing but one more thing sorry because there's so many important things to cover in such a small amount of time um, just wanting to if you do have a power of attorney um, and you might ha you perhaps organised in the past and you've got one set up, if you happen to get divorced or so if you separate from that, if your relationship breaks down, yes, a will is revoked um, by divorce, but power of attorney is not. So just something else to keep in mind. Yeah, that's correct. So when you're looking at a change in circumstance, it's really important that you look at every aspect. So a lot of the times people might go, okay, well, I've separated so my or divorced, so my will is automatically revoked, but that doesn't necessarily do the power of attorney. So that ex-partner still has control of your financial affairs if you've put them in place at the banks. The same as if you don't amend your superannuation benefit or any life insurance benefit or policy, then those things as well can be affected. So um, it's really important that as much as you're looking at one aspect, we, we under the umbrella of estate plan, you actually look at everything. And um, as much as you don't want to be speaking to so many different people about your lives, it's really important that you are speaking to the correct people. So your advisors, your accountants, your lawyers, um, your brokers, um, friends and family as well to give you more insight. That's great, girls. Thanks so much for that. I'll just see if there are any questions do come through. Um, and while we're waiting, I, I was glad you mentioned power of attorney. I, I've got a, an elderly aunt. In fact, she turned 93 last week. And for so many years, we've been talking about uh, getting a power of attorney sorted. But it's one of those things that you just never get around to. That's Unfortunately, it. she's got dementia now. So we had to go through a lot of trouble yep. applying to VCAT to get her uh, affairs sorted. So uh, it's something very, very important. I think also... Is it, what's the medical directive called? Someone can give you... Uh, it's, there's, there's a couple. There's an advanced care directive, which you can do with the hospital, which is um, a, basically a statement of your wishes. Um, say, for example, if you do want to be resuscitated. Um, and then you've got the medical treatment decision maker, which is the new medical power of attorney, um, so that someone could make uh, decisions on your behalf, your medical decisions on your behalf. And going back to powers of attorney, it's not um, as well just for when you are older, um, they can be put in place now. And we generally put a provision in to say that they actually are only operative once you cease having capacity to make decisions for yourself. Yeah, I, I mentioned last week, actually, I, I saw a stat that the number of people in the 65 age group uh, making a will in the last few months uh, had gone up eightfold compared to the oh, same time last that's year. Good. But that's great. But it also uh, said that in the 18 to 24 year old group, it had gone up sevenfold. So it's great that people are thinking about these things so early. Yeah. Are you, are you seeing a lot of activity around getting wills done right now? Given the, the, yeah, the, most the definitely. Drop? Yes, it's absolutely increased. And, and like you said, a lot of young, um, younger generations, or younger people don't tend to get their will in place because they don't feel it's necessary. They don't have any assets. It's not, you know, they say, oh, I just have my car and, and a, a student loan and that's it. But at the end of the day, they've got their super, they've been working. Um, it's, it is just as important to get that will in place no matter what age. But yes, we have seen an increase recently as well. And making an amendment to your will, a codicil, uh, how involved is that? Is, what, what, if I wanted to make a, a slight amendment to my will, how do I go about it? 
It's very simple. It's a matter of, um, it's a separate document that, go, uh, that coincides with your will. And it's basically just an amendment saying this clause no longer applies or this clause is now amended. Mm -hmm. Depending on the um, mm -hmm. amendment that is being made, it might be worth just redoing the entire will, um, but a codicil is just as easy to do. And that, uh, that coincides with your will and they speak to each other. Another uh, a survey I saw said that, it was from England, it said that if a, a lawyer or financial planner who is helping estate planning uh, with a client asks at the time whether they would consider giving a gift to a cause, the number that do actually doubles. It's a yeah. very important question to ask. So I'd like you to ask everyone in the attendees here if they consider <laughs> that, and then, then our request would, would double. Exactly. That is very, very true. So at the end of the day, they're like, oh, yes, well, you know, I might not be able to provide it now, but once I've passed away, I'll have all the money in the world. So, yes. <laughs> exactly. Well, we might leave it there. Girls, thank you so much, Catherine. Thanks so much, Samantha, and thanks to the support of the Canny Group. And I'm pleased to say that um, that offer of a free will is being extended right through September. So anyone who does uh, want to get their will sorted, now's the time to do it. Um, and uh, just get in touch with me and I'll put you in contact with the right people. So thanks again, Samantha and, uh, and Catherine. Our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Right. Now, Jack, over to you. Thank you. I just would like to say, though, I think Sam and Catherine would both agree, when you have your will done, get it done by a lawyer. Don't go to the post office and fill out the form or off the packet of a Wheaties. Yes, I wouldn't agree. Really. Professionally. Yes, I wouldn't agree more. Yeah. Now, thank you, ladies. Uh, Professor Peter Villeman, uh, we are very privileged to have him today. And Peter, I'm speaking to you in the past tense, but I know you're still here. Um, he's a paediatrician based at University Hospital in Geelong, and he's an MHMRC, that's the National Health and Medical Research Council Career Development Fellow. That in itself is a major appointment. I follow that with great interest. The Director of Research at Bowen Health and the Chair in Medical University. He co-leads the Bowen Infant Study and the Children's Inpatient Research Collaborate Australia and New Zealand. The internationally recognised Bowen Infant Study is the only study of its kind in the world. The longitudinal study has been running for approximately 10 years and is closely following over a thousand mothers and their children, collecting samples, taking measurements, all designed to unlock the early life secrets of a disease and health, a fascinating and important world-class research project being conducted right here in Geelong on our doorstep. Now, Peter has been the chief investigator on 15 successful MHMRC applications, including two current CIA projects grants. He's published more than 60 peer-reviewed articles in the last five years. I'm still doing my first. Peter's own research focuses on the role of gut bacteria in promoting healthy development in early life. Now, gut bacteria is one of the most complex issues in today's uh, studies and is very, very complex. He is a passionate about the integration of research and clinical care to improve the health of our community. As Director of Research at Bowen Health, Professor Villeman has responsible oversight over all Bowen Health research projects, including those within the exciting new Adrian Costa Clinical Trials Centre. Professor Peter, we look forward to what you have to say and thank you very much for joining us. Are you just on mute, Pete? Thanks, Jack, for that very generous introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'll just share my screen if I can. Are you seeing that now? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So I, um, I'd first like to um, pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on, the Wadawarong people of the Kulin Nation. Um, my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And it really is a, it's a tremendous privilege to be here and, and part of this event today. I'm not sure whether you can see this, but there are over 50 people in the room with you at the moment. So I'd say it's, an, it's a really nice gathering of folks. One of the comments that's come through on the, uh, the Q&A is, what a great local couple, Brian and Joan are. Thank you, and I couldn't agree more. Um, so I think we're in a really interesting and exciting point in the history of um, research in our region. There's been a lot of great work done over the 
um, preceding decades, but we are at an inflection point where things are really starting to take off uh, and where we're seeing the health service and our major partner, Deakin University, lean in together and say, well, what are the really major problems that face our community? How do we seriously go about trying to tackle those problems, come up with new strategies and improve the outcomes for our community? So this is our, our shared vision statement. Um, and I think you know, vis vision statements can sometimes make me feel a little bit glazy, but uh, this is really about us being sufficiently ambitious. And, and, and what, what we've said as a group is that within a decade, the Bowen Health and Deakin University partnership will make outstanding contributions to discovery, evaluation and translational research that have a measurable impact on the health of our community. And what I think all Barwon Health Deakin University researchers recognise is that this is our greatest asset. This is what makes us special, what, what divides us from some of the, the larger centres in, in, in metropolitan areas of the country. We have this incredible, large, engaged population. And Barwon Health is really quite unique in providing cradle to grave care across all aspects of healthcare to a single population like this. So we have a very unique capacity to understand the kind of life course of, uh, of health and disease. We have grown substantially over recent de decades from what was really a, a small regional hospital into what is now a very major tertiary centre um, that provides all services um, and does so at a very high level. One of the challenges we, we face though is that when the, the government funding system for hospitals moved from um, block grants to activity-based funding, it was no longer aligned for research in the, in the, hospital, in the government provided budget. And so that's meant that our research programs have had to really struggle to survive over, over the course of this period of growth. And so there's been uh, something of a mismatch in the growth of our clinical service relative to our, our research infrastructure. So why is research important to Barwon Health? It's absolutely fundamental to the way we go about things. It, it drives a culture of curiosity, innovation and evidence-based care. If we're not engaged with research, we're not systematically thinking about how do we do things better? How do we reduce risks? How do we improve outcomes? So research is at the very heart of the kind of culture that you want to have in your health service. And these, these are not just words, there's now very strong evidence that shows if you have a strong, a thriving research program within a health service, that it is associated with measurable benefits in outcomes for the consumers of that health service, and that these benefits accrue over time. It's crucial to our brand. We, we uh, our capacity to conduct world-class research is one of the most important ways that we go about attracting and retaining the best and the brightest to our organisation and our community. Excellence attracts excellence. Our ability to identify and respond to the needs of our community depends on research. Unless we are out there measuring things, we don't know where the problems are and it and, and data plays an incredibly important part in driving policy. And I think we've all seen that perhaps more clearly than at any time in, in, in living memory over the, the course of this year in the COVID-19 pandemic, how important data is and evidence-based decision-making is. And in among that is the importance of clinical trials, one component of the research we do. Trials are crucial to Bowen Health consumers because they, they provide a, a way of accessing cutting edge treatments. 
And clinical trials are really the only way, the only way we can really know whether a new treatment is safe and whether it's effective. It was interesting to hear um, Brian speaking at the start of the, the webinar about one of the trials that he was in, in which he was randomised to placebo um, and how he got, it was unwell after he'd commenced on the study medication. And I think that really just goes to highlight the importance of randomised placebo controlled trials, because unless we are conducting the trial, uh, we, we, you know, you might erroneously think that that illness was due, caused by the, by the medication when in fact it was a chance association because it was with the placebo. And can, having a thriving trials program does much more than just provide answers to the questions being asked by that trial. It improves the way we do everything. Uh, these are some really nice data that from uh, Neil Orford and the intensive care team that demonstrate this point really nicely. So what you see over here on the left is a whole series of multi-center randomized control trials that our intensive care unit has been involved in with over the last decade or so, looking at different strategies for improving the treatment of sepsis of severe life-threatening infection. The interesting thing is that each of these trials was in fact a negative outcome. These, none of these interventions actually identified a, a benefit from the treatment strategy. There were other, other trials that did, but these, these trials by and large were negative trials. Yet over the same period, what we see on the right-hand side of the slide is a stepwise improvement in survival rates among people with infection. And what this tells us is that when we're conducting trials, we are thinking in great detail about everything that we do. We're thinking in great detail about every little improvement we can, we can make to, to, to the way we, we provide care. And that process in and of itself leads to improved outcomes. So this is, uh, this is uh, a page from our recently launched research website, um, which uh, lists the 19 different clinical groups that are involved with research at Barwon Health. And there's, there's an extraordinary amount of work going on. There is, there, at the moment, there are over 800 active pro projects that Barwon Health is involved in, um, nearly 200 clinical trials. And I obviously not gonna be able to go through all of that or we'll be here for a very long time, but I will, I'll, I'll highlight some of the, uh, the really interesting stuff that's underway. Uh, in my, my own group, we've been interested in trying to develop ways to keep kids with asthma um, out of the hospital uh, because the most common reason that, that young children are admitted to hospital in Geelong and around Australia and, and, and most parts of the world is a wheezing illness such as, as, as asthma. We conducted a survey of asthma symptoms are among the 91 primary school in the, in the region. We had the vast majority of, of parents complete the survey. From that, we recruited a group of uh, nearly 300 kids with asthma. And then over a two and a half year period, we conducted a randomized control trial of the parents starting a medication called prednisolone at home to try and prevent hospital admission. And we showed that this strategy was effective and it's subsequently been taken up in international asthma management guidelines. But prednisolone doesn't work in the preschool age group. So we've just, uh, in, the, in the last funding round, been funded by the National Health and Medical Research Council to be the lead site in a trial of what's called a bacterial lysate, called OM85, across 35 hospitals in Australia and New Zealand. Um, this is based on the fact that kids who come from rich microbial environments like farms with livestock are at dramatically reduced risk of wheezing illnesses and asthma. And there's a whole lot of laboratory-based data to support the hypothesis that if you um, give children a broken down form of bacteria, orally, it primes their immune system to have a more vigorous response to a viral illness, but then also not to over and respond and cause airway inflammation. So this would be, I think, 
among the first examples of Geelong being the lead site in such a large scale multi-centred trial. Our neurology team are passionate about redressing inequities of access to care for strokes among people living in regional Australia. One of the um, key issues for people living in regional Australia is that the time interval between the onset of the stroke and the point at which you can try and do things to remove the clot uh, has precludes them accessing those treatments. And that's been because that time limit has been set at four hours. This is a trial that our team were um, recently involved here. We have um, Ben Clissold and Paul Torman, which demonstrated that in fact, that time interval is more like nine hours. And that has a really important implications for people in our region, because it means that many people who would not have been able to access um, treatment to remove those clots will now be able to do so. This is our wonderful infectious disease team. I'm sure you will have seen uh, particularly Eugene's face gracing the front of the, of the Geelong Advertiser every second day over the recent months. And they have been doing an absolutely superb job. And you know they have played no small part in protecting our community from the COVID pandemic um, and certainly have been played a pivotal role in, in allowing us to stay in stage three rather than stage four lockdown. So they've done an absolutely superb job there. Of course, they have many other um, fit, uh, strings to their, to their bow. They have a background in working on Bensdale ulcers. Um, and these Bensdale ulcers or Mycobacterium ulcerans is important, not just because we see it in the Barwon region, but because it's a major core source of morbidity and mortality in low income environments. And so if we can learn about the the biology and the treatment of Mycobacterium ulcerans in Geelong, then we can, we can give that as a gift to the world. And what our team has been among the leaders in showing is that medical management is effective in the vast majority of cases and moving towards shorter and shorter courses of treatment. Um, and, and, and in turn, I guess, making those treatments less toxic for the patients involved and more, more readily um, available and feasible for people in low income communities. And of course, most recently they have, uh, we were one of the um, few sites in Australia selected for, uh, to be a site for one of the very early uh, COVID-19 vaccine trials. And that's very exciting and fantastic to hear that Brian and Joan are participating in that. And we thank them for that. The, this is our surgical team. Um, we have a mixture of folk here with um, uh, general surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, surgeons involved in colorectal uh, cancers, surgeons in, involved with, uh, with breast cancer, a whole range of specialties. What many people don't realise is that David Waters and team actually play a very, very prominent role in the delivery of surgical services to the third world to developing countries to, and in particular to the Pacific region and Timor. Glenn Guest here spends um, a month or so in Timor each year. They, Glenn and David have established a surgical training program that is now becoming, heading toward being self-sustaining in, in the Timor region. And so they make a contribution, not just to us being an academic centre, but to our role in, in improving the health outcomes around the globe. Richard Page, uh, who's an orthopaedic surgeon's team, um, have really taken on the job of trying to uh, reduce low value care and improve and, in, and increase high value care. So one of the really nice examples of this is a recent study where they've shown that if people, people gen, in the traditional approaches when people have an, a knee replacement is to have one knee, knee replacement, and then some months later to have a second knee replacement. What Richard's team has recently shown is that it, you have better outcomes, um, faster recovery uh, overall, if the two, two knee replacements are done simultaneously by two surgeons. 
Um, our emergency department, I don't know where they find the time because they're incredibly busy, but they, uh, Julian Staller, Jeremy Furich, um, are both very active researchers um, looking to build their program. And they're asking all sorts of really sensible questions about how do we deliver safe care in our emergency? How do we unblock the, the, the department so that we can service people um, in, a, in a reasonable um, amount of time? So this is one of their recent papers, why do fast track patients stay more than four hours in the emergency department? An investigation of factors that predict, predict length of stay. And this is all about asking those little questions and big questions about how we do every little thing better. This is Soren Alexanderson, um, who leads the Geelong Centre for Emerging Infectious Diseases, which is a partnership between Barwon Health, CSIRO and Deakin University. Um, and so so Soren is a expert virologist. Um, some about two years ago, we noticed a series of um, serious infections among young babies on the ward um, and were ident what we found coming back from the vigil laboratory in Melbourne was that these were caused, caused by a, a, a virus called parechovirus that we knew little about. So we took this to Siren and his team subsequently did a whole lot of very in-depth work and identified a novel strain of uh, parechovirus that was causing these illnesses and uh, and now heading toward building a case for developing a vaccine for that virus. And of course, siren has been very involved in the COVID-19 cohort study um, and has already submitted genomic data from the uh, COVID-19 infections that we've had in our region to the, uh, to the large international genomic databases. We're seeing some of our groups come together on, in really important ways. So uh, in the middle here, we have Julie Pascoe and on the right, Mark Kotovitz, who have led the Geelong osteoporosis study and have made some really uh, very significant contributions to uh, optimising bone health and reducing frailty over the, over the life course. And this is uh, Neil Orford, who is the uh, recently stepped down as the Director of Intensive Care. Um, to allow a bit more time for his academic work. Neil has worked with Julie and Mark to um, show the important impact that a stay in intensive care has on bone health. And they have recently managed to secure one of the highly competitive Medical Research Future Fund grants to conduct the first multi-centre trial of um, an, an agent known as denosumab to uh, investigate whether denosumab can protect the bone health of women who have had a, an intensive care stay. This is our cardiology trials unit, led by John and Marina, who are involved in a vast number of cardiology trials and uh, frequently get awarded as, as one of the outstandingly successful and high quality sites um, internationally. They're also involved in a range of um, non-pharmacological -pharm investigations. And this is one of the really nice trials that's in development between Bowen Health and Deakin University, using some of the Deakin University capacity in the delivery of virtual care uh, to have a, a, a smartphone cardiac rehabilitation assisted self-management versus usual care. So this is about providing a virtual um, care package for people who are recovering from a, a myocardial event. <clears throat> These lovely group of people are our palliative care team um, and they do an extraordinary job of caring for our community. Somewhere in among doing that, they uh, also contribute continually to trying to work out how we do things better. So this is one of their recent papers, prognostic markers of overall survival in cancer patients attending a cachexia support service. And what they've found is that muscle bulk is really important. And so building on that, Peter Martin over here on the right and the team from Deakin are developing another virtual care package to try and promote um, muscle retention among people with, uh, with cancer illnesses. And this is our very formidable um, mental health care team led by uh, the incredibly prolific Michael Burke. This is, this is uh, I've taken this off 
uh, Google Scholar. Michael's um, has uh, well over 700 publications. He has something in the order of 8,000 citations per year, which is just off the Richter scale. He's uh, in the top two or three uh, most cited mental health researchers in the world, and he's here in Geelong. Um, alongside Michael, we have Felice Jacker, who has quite literally invented and developed the field, field of nutritional psychiatry, and Olivia Dean, who is an outstanding young researcher. In fact, she's in, uh, recently been made a high site, mean, meaning she's getting a, a, a very high number of citations for her work too. And they've they, they have produced just a vast amount of data. A lot of Michael's work has looked on re at repurposing existing cost-effective medications for use in people with mental health illnesses. So this is a, a trial showing the benefits across a whole range of symptoms of schizophrenia using an old cheap medication called anacetylcysteine. And this is a, um, these are data from the SMILES trial that Felice led which uh, was the first trial in the world to show a very significant impact on depressive symptoms among people with major depression from a dietary intervention. The environment for conducting clinical trials is changing. It's becoming more competitive. Um, the pharmaceutical industry is accessing um, and conducting a large proportion of their trials in lower income environments. And so the level of uh, payment that clinical trials teams receive from the pharmac pharmacological industry is less than it used to be. So international co competition has, has, has made this a tougher game than it used to be. To compete in that environment and to continue to build capacity, we need combined negotiating strength, we need economies of scales, we need efficient systems, we need adequate resources, and we need well-trained and well-enabled um, people. So for the first time uh, over the course of the last year, our 10 separate clinical trial groups have decided to come together and join forces. And we've had a whole series of workshops to um, try and develop this concept. And we have come together around the idea that a centralised model will improve competitiveness and sustainability. It'll improve infrastructure and training. It'll create training opportunities and help us uh, develop succession planning for some of the more senior members of our academic community. It will build and provide a focus for our research culture and capacity and it will improve our ability to give our consumers access to cutting edge treatments, better access, better care, better outcomes. We uh, commissioned a external expert to come and conduct a review of clinical trials at Barwon Health and to provide recommendations on the establishment of a clinical trials centre. And then of course, the wonderful Costas um, walked in and really in the midst of uh, you know, our community's darkest hour, I think, uh, sort of stepped forward as a family and said, we are going to make a very substantial, incredibly generous contribution to the provision of care um, by Barwon Health at, uh, at, the, at the University Hospital. Um, and without that support, the, I have no doubt that the, the, the idea of establishing a clinical trials centre would remain a good idea and just that, but that support is, um, is, has meant that it's, it is going to happen. And of course, it, the centre is going to be um, named after the late Adrian Costa, who's here with his brothers. And um, you know, this, this has happened after we have had a, um, a, a major cyber attack and then we've been thrown into the midst of having to manage the COVID pandemic. And so it's been important, not just in terms of what it enables us to do with clinical trials, but in terms of morale. It's really been a very significant boost to, to uh, the health workforce in, the, in our community. So I really, uh, I could go on for a very long time about how grateful I am, but I am sincerely grateful. We, uh, and we, we are intent on ensuring that that contribution is put to the best possible use. 
We have gone through a detailed process of establishing the governance around the new clinical trial centre, established and ratified the terms of reference, and that's a detailed and important process. We have um, uh, established an advisory um, committee, which is chaired by Eugene Nathan and deputy chaired by um, Olivia Dean. We have now uh, agreed upon a position description for a, a um, director of um, the new Adrian Costa Clinical Trial Centre, and we will be uh, hoping to advertise that position in the coming weeks. And that, that person will play a key role in, in the development of the centre. The Clinical Trial Centre will be located on the top floor of, the, uh, of Building B, the old Geelong Private Hospital site, and it is a, a fantastic position. It's got superb views, it's very prominent, and we will be working through a detailed process to make sure that this is a clinical trial centre that is built around person-centred care and is as good as any in the world. So, how can you help? <laughs> um, first, I, I'd encourage you to have a look at our new research website. We've spent a, um, a fair bit of time over the last year putting this together, and I think you would be, um, I hope you would be surprised to see the depth and quality of research that's underway at Bowen Health. As I mentioned, we've got 19 different um, clinical research areas, each of them are, being, uh, are productive, each of them are doing important um, game-changing work. You can, on the research website, there is a support us um, tab that you can follow. Um, and, and if I can highlight areas where I think we, we um, really need assistance, it's actually primarily about people. So uh, equipment, um, and consumables are important. But what is really difficult in the current environment where we get no funding from um, the Department of Health and Services or the government for research in a, in a public hospital is the funding required to support and grow our young researchers. So one of the key things that we need to do is create um, more fellowship positions so that our young doctors, nurses, allied health folks coming through their clinical training can combine both their clinical training and research training. And by having fellowship positions uh, that are funded by philanthropy, what we will see is that that, you know, really has a very long-term effect on the, the volume and quality of research that's, um, that's conducted at, at our organisation. Um, I'm sure if anyone would like to sit down and talk to me or any of the research to, um, researchers at Bowen Health, except perhaps Eugene Nathan and his team at the moment, because they're pretty busy, um, that, uh, that we would all be very pleased to do that. So thank you for your time. Thank you again to, to the Costa family. I, I noticed that uh, Robert Costa was on the, on the meeting today. So thank you very much, Robert. Um, and uh, thank you. Yeah. I'll hand back to you, Francis. Thanks very much, Pete. I think one of the things that the typical of Robert Costa, that one of the uh, things they want to, to make everyone aware of, that the, their gift was not only to provide health benefits, not only to support what's a really important, you know, industry of sorts in Geelong, but it was also to inspire others to get involved. Um, and, I, you know, as, as you said, I think that what, you know, what they've done is, is quite extraordinary. Peter, I might just ask you a couple of questions, see if anyone else uh, wants to. They can just put up their hand or type it into the chat. Um, you mentioned Professor Soren Alexanderson earlier, who's head of the Geelong Centre for Emerging Infectious Diseases. And he said to me that the stars align in Geelong for, for his work because you've got the CSIRO, you've got the Animal Health Laboratory, you've got Deakin, and you've got the hospital. And so it's just a, a perfect, a perfect alignment. But in your area of, um, of the Bowen Infant Study and, and also with the Geelong Osteoporosis uh, Study, I understand that it, the stars also align in doing those sort of, that sort of research in Geelong. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I mean, there's no way you could do the bar and infant study successfully in Melbourne. Um, and that's because uh, one of the really com key components of the bar and infant study was to um, recruit women uh, antenatally and to collect samples of birth. So we had um, a very detailed series of samples collected in, uh, when the babies were born, and that they were collected in, uh, in over 95% of, of occasions because our midwives were just so engaged with the whole process. Um, and it was that level of, you know, these things are all built on relationships and that's where, that's where Geelong is superb. We, we're just the right size, you know, we're big enough to have the numbers. We have 3000 babies born in Geelong each year at, at the University Hospital Geelong, but small enough that it's still got that kind of country hospital feel about it. And those two, or two, 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 two sometimes three degrees of separation between the whole community um, which is absolutely crucial to the, the, the logistics involved in running large studies. And you also had that mix of uh, city, urban and rural, which I think is very important in your, your work. Particularly. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a mixture of environments. We've got, you know, farming environments, we've got industrial areas, we've got coastal areas, we've got urban areas. We've got a mi mixture of um, uh, industries that people are working in. Um, we've got a mixture of, uh, of social backgrounds and areas of vulnerability, areas of great strength. Um, and so, and, and when you look at the demographics of the, the Bowen region, it is, it is uh, representative of most parts of Australia. So it really is um, a sort of ideal setting in which to be conducting these studies. And it's, you know, that, that th these are things that, really do separate it from the from the tertiary centres in Melbourne and other uh, Sydney and around the country. You talked before how brave uh, Joan and Brian are in, in uh, taking on this this um, vaccine uh, trial. How, how confident are you um, of success with all these trials happening around the world into COVID? Yeah, I mean, it, it hasn't been, I mean, I think we've seen the moon landing here in a way, haven't we? We hope we have, that we have gone from um, from nothing to hopefully an effective vaccine with, you know, with evidence within a, a period of 12 to 18 months. I think the likelihood of us getting there is very high. There are so many vaccines under development around the world and there is such a um, large groundswell of public support to conduct the trials that need to be done to evaluate, to determine which of these is the most effective, which is the safest, uh, I think we're going to get there, you know, incredibly quickly, and and that's it. That really will be an amazing public health achievement. Um, but it, it's an it's an achievement that the scientific team could never make if it wasn't for Joan and Brian, and and their and their and their colleagues. Yeah, yeah, and the costas. And the costas. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's look, it's ten past or six past three. And Pete, thanks so much for your time. I know you're you're one incredibly busy man. And thanks so much for putting time aside to to speak to us today. Thanks to Catherine, Samantha, particularly Brian and and Joan. Before I hand you back to Jack, I just wanted to make mention that this webinar, together with the other webinars we've been doing over the last few weeks, will be on our website um, uh, before the weekend. So if you miss one or you want to to review them. Uh, you, you're welcome to do that. I want to thank everyone for participating because uh, it's so important you do that. And, you know, please continue, if you can, to support us uh, uh, because you can see the incredible work that Pete does. You know, he's going to save lives, basically. Over to you, Jack. If you do decide to leave something, you will. You have the privilege of joining our Tim Malloy Society. And that has very many exciting things which will be happening both on and off uh, the COVID dynamic. Mm. I have to say that I received a text during this uh, talk, Francis, three words, Beethoven, you Philistine. That's in respect to the music that was painted and uh, Sergeant Opry sent me that. I will take issue with him later on. Um, Samantha and Catherine, you two talented people, thank you very much for your time and uh, thank you for your assistance. Uh, your, your words of wisdom are well documented. Peter, what can we say? You've actually unaware. First of all, I was very pleased to see that you um, mentioned the benefit of the, one of a veterinarian's favourite drug called prednisolone. That's terrific to see it still being used. But secondly, you did settle a large wager during your talk. 
there's a group of us who meet every week for lunch when we're allowed. And part of our job is to raise money for research into Bowen Health. When we do that, we enjoy it. But there's been a debate over the last three years because when old blokes like us get together, we talk about our diseases, whether it's our heart, our prostate or whatever. And a number of us had joint replacements. One of our number had two done at once and one had one done at once. And you've just settled the argument about which was better. So thank you very much. And no doubt, uh, Mr. Michael Fairweather will collect his uh, due things. But Peter, thank you very, very much. And we do really appreciate what you're doing and look forward to the work that you will be doing with Bowen Health. So if you have a chance, think of us in your will. And uh, also thank you very much to Francis for all his work in putting this together. So take care. Thank you. Thanks, Jack, and good luck to Joan and Brian. Thanks, everyone.